Good morning. My name Tom Fresh, your host, will be with you here for the next hour. We're going to continue the reading and discussion of the book The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives. I want to pick up this morning where we left off yesterday with this extraordinary example of a group of Protestants in Maryland, the Maryland colony, the Roman Catholic colony of Maryland, were uh, engaged in uh, Protestant service and were overheard by the proprietor of the building, who happened to be Roman Catholic, the Protestants saying that uh, the Pope was Antichrist. And being Catholic, he attempted to uh, lock the building and prevent the Protestants from using the building any longer for their services, and he was hauled into court. And the Maryland uh, quote-unquote fathers at the time bent over backwards to uh, establish the religious liberties of the Protestants in this case. And I'll just uh, pick up a uh, portion of the last sentence we read yesterday. It said, full to running over was the measure of religious liberty accorded by this Jesuit priest to his Protestant service uh, servants in agreeing that Lewis, who had interrupted the reading of a controversial sermon, quote, was fit to be punished, unquote, for his overzeal. It would really seem as if Father Copley, in this practical application of an ideal, had stood up so straight that he had bent over backwards. So now we're going to find out to what extent the Maryland colony went out of its way to accommodate Protestant religious service in this Maryland colony. He says, on the trial of the case, Lewis admitted coming into the room where the Protestant servants were reading out of a book, quote, and the matter being much reproachful to his religion, namely that the Pope was Antichrist and the Jesuits <clears throat> and the Jesuit anti-Christian ministers, etc. He told them that it was a falsehood and came from the devil, as willful lies did, and that he that writ it, or he that wrote it, was an instrument of the devil. And further he said not. In other words, he didn't, he didn't go any further. Now, it says, said Grave and Gray testified that Lewis said that their ministers were ministers of the devil. Said Grave testified at first that Lewis had forbidden them to use or have any Protestant books within his house, but afterwards weakened on rebuttal when Lewis denied forbidding the servants reading any books except the book that they were reading, and finally admitted that it might have been only the one book they were forbidden to read, and not all Protestant books. Three other Protestant witnesses were called, there evidently having been at least five who were being preached to at the time, but they could only recall that Lewis had forbidden the reading of that particular book of sermons. After hearing the witnesses, the governor instructed the secretary to deliver the censure of the court. The secretary found Lewis guilty of making, quote, an offense and indiscreet speech in calling the author of the book an instrument of the devil, unquote, but acquitted him of the accusation of using the offense, uh, the offensive term toward all Protestant ministers. He likewise found him guilty of forbidding his servants to read, quote, a book otherwise allowed and lawful to be read in the state of England, unquote, but acquitted him of the charge of forbidding them to have any Protestant books in the house. Now, it says the record of the judgment of the court reads, quote, Because of his offensive speeches and other unreasonable disputations in point of religion tending to the disturbance of the public peace and quiet of the colony, committed by him against a public proclamation set forth to prohibit all such disputes. In other words, there was a public proclamation to prohibit religious disputes. Remember the advice that was given on the Ark of the Dove? Catholics were told not to engage in religious disputes with the Protestants. Don't do anything to rile up the Protestants. 
Remember, they'd been living in Britain where Catholicism had been suppressed. And Protestantism was the, 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 the state church. And they, they were, the, these Catholics were coming to the colonies to have religious liberty. Certainly they didn't want to instantly get back into uh, religious disputes with the Protestants and have Protestant Great Britain, who still had control of the colonies, to impose uh, Protestantism as the state religion of the colonies. So, so Catholics had to be very careful, especially in this Roman Catholic colony of, of Maryland, not to disturb the peace over religious matters. I mean, after all, if the Pope wants to take control of these United States of America, we certainly can't start right off the bat with having squabbles with Protestants in colonial times. You can't get there, you can't get here from there if you begin religious persecution against Protestants in the colonies because Protestant Great Britain is going to uh, not put up with it. And besides that, they were bordered by Protestant Virginia. So there was a public prohibition against such disputes in the Maryland colony. I'll continue with the quote. It says, Therefore he fined him 500 weight of tobacco to the lord of the province and to remain in the sheriff's custody until he found sufficient sureties for his good behavior on those kinds in time to come. It says the captain likewise found him to have offended against the public peace and against the proclamation made for the suppression of all such disputes, tending to cherishing a faction in religion, one faction or another, Catholic or Protestant, and therefore find him likewise 500, I suppose, weight of tobacco again, to the lord of the province. But for his good behavior, thought fit to leave it, to his own discretion. The governor concurred wholly in his sentence with Mr. Secretary, and so the court broke up, and William Lewis was committed to the sheriff. So, you have a Roman Catholic co uh, colony, a Roman Catholic, uh, a Roman Catholic uh, was offended by Protestant services, wherein Pope, the Pope was labeled Antichrist, and he sought to uh, stop them from reading their book and stop them from meeting, and the Roman Catholic government of the Roman Catholic colony of Maryland defended the Protestants and punished the Catholic. That's the extent to which at least this author claims that Maryland went out of its way to stay out of religious disputes with Protestants in the colonies. Now, is religious liberty the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church? Not if you're familiar with Roman Catholic canon law, and especially not if you're familiar with the Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent. Protestants are heretics to be burned at the stake. I mean, that's why Protestants have always sought religious liberty. Once they became Protestants, you know, they were all Catholics before. They got copies of their own Bibles in their own languages. And they read for themselves, and they instantly recognized the church, that the church that they were in, the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, was that church of Antichrist. So that's the age-old teaching of Protestantism. Never heard today, obviously, but that's the age of that's the that's the genesis of the Protestant Reformation. That's the beginning and ending of the Protestant Reformation. The biblical understanding of the Roman Catholic Church and its prophetic role in the world as the Church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan and the Pope is that man of sin. The papacy is that man of sin, the son of perdition, that's guilty of the blood of the, the saints and the martyrs and all the slain of the earth. They weren't questioning it. They knew it for a fact, so much so that they'd willingly go to the stake and burn for the belief. 
And they sought religious liberty in the colonies to get away from the religious persecution in Europe by the Pope. No, the true teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is there is only one church under God whereby salvation is even obtainable, and that's the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church has the divine prerogative to exterminate heresy off the planet and to create a global, quote-unquote, Christian government and Christian religion, when in fact it's the Church of Antichrist. Now, that's the realization we all have to come to grips with, or prove it to be an error. But let me tell you, when you stand up to try to prove this to be an error, you stand in the face of all the Protestant Reformers, because they disagreed about a lot of things, but on this one count, they were unanimous. The Scriptures were just too vivid in their description of this this Antichrist system, which has control of our government today. But here we are in the fledgling days of the colonies and the and the, the the careful, cautious, incremental creation of the Colossus we see in the world today, right here in the Maryland colony. Look how gingerly they stepped in the in the in the original Maryland colonies in the early days in the sixteen thirties. Now, he says, quote, uh, the, quote, public proclamation set forth to prohibit all such disputes, unquote, probably referred to Lord Baltimore's letter of instruction. Remember, Lord Baltimore instructed them. His instructions, which may have been embodied in the proclamation of the governor, it does not appear that this Catholic tribunal ever meted out any punishment to the Protestants for reading aloud a sermon that was calculated to offer, quote, an unseasonable disputation in point of religion tending to the disturbance of the public peace and quiet of the colony, unquote. Although a sermon branding the Pope as Antichrist might at least have been deemed disputatious if not provocative, to the extent of being a breach of the peace. See, so so the same justice that, that was leveled against this Catholic Lewis might have been leveled justly against the Protestants for proclaiming Pope Antichrist. But that's not what happened in Maryland. They took a position against the Catholic. And it says, the effect of the decision evidently was to allow the Protestant laity the full liberty to regale themselves with the reading of all sermons, regardless of how controversial they might be, or what manner of things might be said of the Catholic religion. With Father Copley, the judges agreed in allowing the fullest measure of religious liberty, a liberty of worship and a liberty of speech. Thereafter, if any Catholic overheard anything that was offensive to his religion, he was told to keep his peace. Now that's treading pretty gingerly in a Roman Catholic in a Roman Catholic colony. But remember, Catholicism has to survive to this our day. Rome thinks in terms of hundreds of years. Rome has had a strategy for this country from the beginning. That's the thesis here at Inquisition Update. That's the thesis of John Daniel, who recommended this book. And he says, It was not often that religious peace of the colony was disturbed in the early years. Evidently, the Protestants were allowed the uh, the quite excuse me, the quiet enjoyment of their religion, and there was no evidence that they ever interfered with Catholic worship. It was not until four years later that another case is recorded where Protestants had reason to seek redress, which was promptly given. In 1642, one Thomas Gerard, a prominent Catholic landowner, was accused of taking away the key to the building which the Protestants used for a chapel, and also with carrying off the books which were used for Protestant worship, probably the hymn and prayer books, possibly the Bible itself. 
Just what prompted Mr. Gerard to do this does not appear, but does not appear. But apparently, it was due to some claim of ownership to the land or the building. But the very obvious result was that the Protestants were deprived of their right of worship. Again, they were quick to seek redress. This time, they made their petition to the Colonial Assembly, which was then in session, and to which all the freemen of the uh, province had been summoned to attend in person or by proxy. The following is the entry in the case taken from the archives. Quote, 23rd of March. The petition of the Protestants was read complaining against Mr. Thomas Gerard for taking away the key of the chapel and carrying away the books out of the chapel and such proceedings desired against him for it is to justice uh, for it is to justice appertaineth mr gerard being charged to make answer the house upon hearing of the pro, uh, prosecute of the prosecutors and his defense found mr gerard guilty of a misdemeanor and that he should bring the books and the key taken away to the place where he had them and relinquish all title to them or to the house, and should pay a fine of 500 pounds of tobacco towards the maintenance of the first minister as should arrive, unquote. So here we get, again, we see a decision going against a Catholic who, who, uh, who tried to deprive Protestants of their religious liberty. He says, here again it is found a measure of religious liberty accorded to the Protestants full to overflowing. For not only was the offered order to return the keys and the books to the chapel and to pay a fine, but the fine was to be used to pay the salary of the Protestant clergyman who should arrive. It is difficult to conceive of more convincing proof of the establishment of religious liberty in early Maryland and of the determination of the Catholic authorities of the colony to afford sanctuary to Protestants and to grant them the fullest protection in the exercise of their religion than is afforded by these two cases. In one case, there is an adjudication by a properly constituted legal tribunal, and in the other, a special act of democratic assembly of freemen having full force and effect in the law of the colony. This was more than a mere toleration. It was religious liberty established and recognized practically, rationally, and legally. Up to this time, uh, we are concerned only with Catholics and Protestants. There were none in the colony except those who called themselves Christians. When at a later day the Jew came to Maryland, he too was accorded the fullest measure of freedom. Now, chapter 5 of the book is entitled, The Exercise of Self-Government. He said it was not long before there was manifest in all of the American colonies a spirit of independence and a jealousy of charter rights. In Maryland, from the beginning, there was independence of both king and parliament, and a real exercise of self-government. The charter gave assurance of independence of British government, and when Lord Baltimore conceded to the freemen the right to initiate legislation, they lost no time in assuming that this granted them the right to exercise self-government, and they acted accordingly. When Lord Baltimore decided not to accompany the first settlers to Maryland and to remain in England, he suffered the disadvantage of a lack of direct contact with the colonists. This resulted in a, in a greater freedom for the latter, of which they were quick to take advantage. John Eston Cook, in his Virginia, A History of the People, says that, quote, never was social fabric established on a larger or more liberal basis than that of Maryland, unquote. Upon this social fabric, sensible lawmakers were to erect the framework of an American form of self-government. Now we're going to see this, this colonial Maryland becoming the model for our American form of government. It says, the first legislative assembly met at St. Mary's. 
February 1635. This, like some of the sessions which followed, was based on the idea of a pure democracy, all the freemen being summoned to attend either in person or by proxy. This assembly passed a body of laws for the government of the province. The records of the first assembly are lost. It is only known that one law provided that murder and felonies should be punished, as in England. These laws were sent to Lord Baltimore for his approval, but whatever they were, he did not approve them, and whatever his reasons were for not approving them is not known. No effective legislation was enacted until the session of 1639. Therefore, it appears that for five years the colonists of Maryland got along without laws of their own. The matter of legislation did not seem to concern them greatly. Neither then nor later did they have any such obsession for lawmaking as had the Puritans of Massachusetts. It was during these five years that the colony grew and prospered, becoming a group of happy and contented people more interested in building homes and tilling the soil than making laws and fixing penalties. The people dwelt together like a patriar patriarchal family, having little need for a written code of laws to regulate their conduct and affairs. Unwritten laws and customs were quite sufficient, and recourse could be had to the common law of England if occasion arose. By making practical application of their religion, they lived peaceably and well. As time went on, the need for some kind of colonial legislation became apparent, so in January of 1638, Colonel Calvert, excuse me, Governor Calvert issued a summons for an assembly of freemen to be held at St. Mary's. And we'll continue with our discussion of the early formation of civil government in the Maryland colony when we return from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after these messages. Listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C R O S S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart 
of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone. Absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe, so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update with Tom Fresh. And Inquisition Update is dedicated to tell the truth, that rare truth, to bring Bible truth to bear that is never discussed in the churches, to bring historical accounts to bear that are never taught in the schools or the churches, and to help us make sense of this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. Inquisition Update is heard Monday through Friday here on this network, www.LibertyRadioLive.com. It's heard at 10 a.m. Central, 11 Eastern, and that is re-aired again in the afternoon at 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. So avail yourselves of those two opportunities, but please, for the greatest flexibility to help support Inquisition Update and LibertyRadioLive.com, subscribe to LibertyRadioLive.com and gain access to the audio archives and listen to all Liberty Radio Live programming at your leisure. That's what I do. Catch up on the weekends. Busy during the week, and uh, when I get a chance on the weekend to rest, I pick up uh, what I can on the weekends. And it's very flexible, and you can uh, listen to a certain program over and over if you want or lo- uh, listen to different hosts different programs, and uh, it, it's a great asset, and it's a way to help support LibertyRadioLive.com. Help keep us on the air with your contributions. Now we're going to continue with the book, The Ark and the Dove, by J. Moss Ives. It says, as time went on, <clears throat> oh, before, I want to remind the listeners also, too, that tomorrow I won't be here, but Daryl Everhart will be sitting in for me, so bring your piece of paper and pencil. And uh, carefully listen to what Daryl Everhart says. Highly respected research in this researcher in these areas of study, and a great asset as a guest and a re- and a and a semi regular guest host on uh, Liberty Radio Live programming. So uh, keep in mind tomorrow, Daryl Everhart on uh, Inquisition Update. Now continuing. As time went on, the need for some kind of colonial legislation became apparent. So in January of 1638, Governor Calvert issued a summons 
for an assembly of the freemen to be held at St. Mary's. The counselors and several of the leading men of the colony were summoned by special writ, quote, to assemble the freemen and persuade such, as you shall think proper, to repair personally to said assembly and to give full power and liberty to all the rest, either to be present if they so please or otherwise to elect or nominate such and so many people as they and their major part of them so assembled shall agree upon to be the deputies and burgesses for the said freemen in the name or in the name and stead to in, to advise the count uh, to advise and consult of such things as shall be brought into del- deliberation in the said assembly Unquote. This was to be a popular assembly in which every freeman was to have a voice and a vote. The number of deputies or burgesses was optional with the freemen, and these, so far as they were representative, were merely proxies and so voted. Every freeman had a right to a seat if he chose to claim it. Having given a proxy, he could revoke it at any time and attend in person. Now, this is setting us up for uh, a government of, by, and for the people. That form of government that we champion in this country. Now, it, it doesn't work that way anymore. The government, as we've seen with this health care bill, doesn't give a whit what the people think. They do whatever they whatever they please. Rather, they do whatever they're told. Okay, they're getting their orders from higher up, as high up as you can go, the papacy. But in the beginning, we're having an example set for us, a government of, by, and for the people, where everybody had a vote directly or by proxy if they choose. Now, what is the teaching of Rome? Well, according to the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, Secretary of the U.S. Navy, who was astutely trained to assess foreign and domestic threats to our form of government, asserts that in Roman Catholic canon law, the papacy is the judge of all men, and no no man may judge him, and that all governing authority comes from the papacy. It originates from his breast. And also that the Pope was divinely authorized to rule, to be the vicar or the replacement of Christ on earth, and all men are to be governed by him. All men, Catholic or otherwise, as the replacement of the Son of God on earth, he has all authority invested in him. Now that's the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. That will be disputed by no one who has any knowledge of Roman Catholicism and its laws. So what are we seeing in this so-called Catholic colony named after Mary, Maryland? We're seeing a government of, by, and for the people, where the people govern themselves. No mention of a Jesuit priest overseeing this assembly, No mention of a Roman Catholic hierarchy overseeing this assembly. This is an assembly of freemen where everybody has a vote. Extraordinary thing that's taking place here in this so-called Catholic colony of Maryland. Totally contrary to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And it says the session continued from January 25th to March 24th and was well attended. The first business was the adoption of some simple rules of procedure. The house was to meet every day, Sundays and holidays excluded, at 8 o'clock in the morning and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There are records of fines for being tardy. It was voted that anyone not appearing at the appointed hour be, quote, amherst 20 pounds of tobacco for such default, unquote. Fines after being imposed were remitted in several cases 
for good excuse, such as, quote, want of passage over the St. Mary's River, unquote. Every freeman not only had the privilege of attending, but it was made his duty to attend, either in person or by proxy. On the first day, it was, quote, proclaimed that all freemen omitted in the writs of summons that would claim a voice in this general assembly should come and make their claim. Whereupon claim, uh, whereupon claim was made by John Robinson, carpenter, and he was admitted, unquote. A, a normal carpenter. The average Joe. And if you couldn't make it, you could send a proxy. This is government of by and for the people. And it says, on this first day of assembly, 30 freemen were present in person and 28 sent their proxies. Three were excused from attendance and seven were absent. The three who were excused from attendance were three Jesuit missionaries. Fathers Thomas Copley, Andrew, jo Andrew White, and John Altham. They appeared by Robert Clerk, who, quote, excused their absence by reason of sickness, unquote. So they claimed to be sick. They weren't going to have any Jesuit priests. They weren't allow going to allow themselves to, uh, to be at this, at this uh, session. They excluded themselves. They were excused on uh, grounds of sickness. <laughs> How convenient. They all got sick all at the same time. Now, there's a strategy in this. Now, today, we see the Jesuits running our government through Georgetown and Fordham University, all the Jesuit universities. They train, they cultivate the cream of the intellectual crop. They keep track of where the little geniuses are in all the schools. And they recruit them to these Jesuit universities with big scholarships. And they train them up to be globalists. They train them up to be negotiators, diplomats, ambassadors, executive, legislative, and judicial members, high-level educators, high-level businessmen and bankers. And, and, and they're recruited by our government, Congress, the White House, CIA, the Defense Department. The Vatican controls our government through these Jesuit institutions. But in this case, in the early col colonial period, we have the true powers behind this colonial period uh, bowing out of this assembly. Three Jesuit priests bowing out. What a contrast between then and now. And it says, in order that there should be orderly debate, it was ruled that, quote, no man shall stand up to speak until the party that spake last before him shall have sat down. Nor shall anyone speak but once to a bill at one reading, nor refute the speech of another with any incivil or contentious terms, nor shall name him except by circumlocution. No name calling. Okay. Doesn't happen anymore, does it? But nonetheless. It says on the second day, ten freemen were fined for non attendance, and again, Robert Clerk appeared for the Jesuit fathers, and this time, quote, made excuse for them that they desired to be excused from giving voice in the assembly, unquote. They were excused. Thereafter, no Jesuit attended the colonial assemblies. There was to be no theocracy in Maryland. So they equated, this author even implies that for the Jesuits to have attended would have constituted a theocracy in Maryland. And the Jesuits not wanting there to be a theocracy, or at least not wanting there to appear to be a theocracy, excused themselves from the colonial assembly. Now, they're not so timid today. Jesuit priests led the opening ceremony, uh, the, the opening prayer of Congress when they, when they sat Papist Nancy Pelosi, a Speaker of the House. They gave Nancy Pelosi a private uh, Jesuit mass in her house before she took office. 
the Jesuits are not so quiet anymore. The American people don't know what they are, and so they're visible, even in the, even in the, the federal legislative branch of the government. It says in their aloofness, these Jesuit priests, in their aloofness from lawmaking, the Jesuit missionaries set the Puritan clergy of New England an example which might well have been followed. Okay? Their aloofness from lawmaking. You know who makes the laws in this country today? The laws come down from the Jesuit universities. The law, the, the lawyers, the professors of law at the Jesuit universities write our laws. They wrote the Patriot Act. That's right. No din, di, or, uh, uh, Viet Din, the assistant secretary of uh, the assistant attorney general under Jan, John Ashcroft, Right after 9-11, a Vietnamese Roman Catholic refugee came to this country, hustled through his Jesuit education. They made him assistant uh, attorney general, and he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, worked with the Jesuits at Georgetown University, had the Patriot Act ready to go before the dust ever settled over in Manhattan. That's right, our laws come from Jesuit universities in this country. But here in this case, the Jesuits stood aloof from lawmaking. The Jesuit missionaries set the Puritan clergy of New England an example, which White might well have been followed. Okay? So the Puritans were, were politicians, and these Jesuits are going to set example to keep religion out of politics. Isn't that strange? Because the Vatican, first and foremost, is a political animal. She's involved in every government in the world. All the kings of the earth commit fornication with her, remember? That great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth? What do kings do? They make laws, right? Well, that's where our laws come from, the Vatican, from the Jesuit priests and the universities. The Bible confirms the truth. All we have to do is read it and accept it and use that for the basis of our research, and we come to the truth. And it's in your face once you recognize it. But in this case, they want to separate religion from politics. Early in the Maryland colony, trying to set the example even for the Puritans. Why? Because their goal is eventually going to be eyeball deep in politics in this country. And they are. And you can thank your... You know, you can thank the Jesuits in this country, the Roman Catholic lobby, the Roman Catholic Congress, the Roman Catholic White House for your universal or Catholic health care system. They didn't give a whit what the American people thought. They're going to have their universal Catholic health care system. And we're all going to have to be chipped to have access to it. You want the benefits of Rome, you have to submit to Rome. Nicholas Arthur's right. When he came on the broadcast and told us that we're enslaved by this by this by this Vatican, this Roman society that we live in, is absolutely correct. He said their desire to be excused from giving voice in the assembly may have been responsible for the fact that until this day under the law of Maryland, no member of the clergy has ever had a seat in a legislative body. <laughs> oh. Not so today. Not so today. It says, this first session of the Colonial Assembly, of which there is any record, was featured by a deadlock between Lord Baltimore and the Freeman. This had a most important bearing on the political development of the colony. Apparently, the Lord Proprietor was given the right under the Charter to initiate legislation and to submit such laws for consideration by the freemen as he thought wise and expedient. At least, he claimed this right. The freemen, imbued with the spirit of independence, took issue with him. Well, good for them. What's the matter with America today? Where are the freemen taking issue with government today? We do a lot of griping and complaining, but we don't really take any issue with them. I see the attitudes beginning to change a bit, but the only way you can really take an issue with them is to point out who's really running the whole thing. 
turn the light on. Don't get caught up in the mainstream media manicured debate. Go straight to the heart of the matter. This is all about religion. This is all about the Pope taking control of the world, not just this country. This is all about the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 17, making this once lamb-like government, this once lamb-like land, this once Christian Protestant land, and giving it the voice of the beast and imposing persecution, economic sanctions, military intervention, political infiltration and subversion and corruption in all the nations of the world. The United States meddles in everybody's business. Why? Because they're doing the Pope's bidding. There's where the issue is. And unless we address that issue, we're going to get drawn down a rabbit hole. <clears throat> put, everything aside, put everything else aside and find the heart of the matter. It's all about religion. We have the example in the early Maryland colony that they didn't want religion involved at all in civil government. Separation of church and state. Directly contradictory to the official, the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Like I've said so many times on the program, first and foremost, the papacy is a political animal. She gets done what she wants through politics and war. And the, and the United States is just a mirror image of her, spitting image of her, politics and war. That's how we impose the American will, Pax Americana, which is nothing but Pax Romana. We're the image of the beast. The United States is the image of the beast. Because the beast speaks for us, speaks through the United States. But here in the early, the early Maryland colony, they wanted a separation between church and state, totally contrary to the teaching of, and the history of the Vatican up to this point. This Maryland colony looks nothing like her namesake, the Roman Catholic Church. And continuing, it says, this assembly was composed largely of Catholics. Why? Because it was a Catholic colony. It was a majority Catholic colony. Cobb says that it was made up entirely of Catholics, but he's clearly in error. There's no doubt, however, but that the Catholics controlling this session of the assembly, as they did most of the early assemblies, Notwithstanding that the majority were Catholics and loyal to Lord Baltimore, they did not propose to be puppets for the Lord Proprietor. They insisted on the right to initiate legislation. The first code prepared by Lord Baltimore and intended for passage by the Assembly was brought over by John Luger, who had been appointed Secretary of the Colony. Luger had arrived at St. Mary's in the autumn of 1637. By virtue of his office as secretary, he was a member of the council. He was a graduate of Trinity College, Oxford, and had been an Anglican clergyman, Church of England clergyman, but before his appointment had been converted to Catholicism. He brought his family with him and remained in Maryland, taking an active part in colonial affairs until the death of Governor Calvert when he returned to England. His wife died in Maryland, and on his return to England, he became a Catholic priest. He died in 1665 while ministering to victims of the London Plague. When the laws sent over by Lord Baltimore from England were voted upon, they were rejected by a vote of 37 to 14. Luger voted with the Governor Calvert and others of the council to adopt them, but the freemen, being in the majority, voted against them. He says, there were 12 acts of this draft, and each was separately debated and voted upon. Here was a dilemma. Some said, so the record reads, that they might do well to agree on some laws until they heard from England again. But Governor Calvert said that there was no such power in the assembly. Captain Cornwallis, upon, quote, propound, uh, upon, quote, propounded the laws of England, unquote, and the governor now uh, acknowledged that 
his commission gave him power in civil cases to proceed by the laws of England, and in criminal cases likewise, quote, not extending to life or member, unquote. It says, a committee of five was appointed to draft a code of laws to be submitted to Lord Baltimore. Cornwallis was chairman of this committee. Thereupon the House break up. The House broke up or adjourned and did not meet again for ten days. The committee did not complete its work in ten days, and the governor suggested a further adjournment, but Cornwallis said the freemen could not spend their time better, quote, than in the business for the country's good, unquote. Finally, 14 bills for the government of the province were reported by the committee, <clears throat> and after three successive readings were passed and submitted to Lord Baltimore, but they never became law. So here we have a very slow process of trying to establish civil law in the Maryland colony because it just wasn't important. Is civil law important to the Vatican today? You better believe it is. And what we're seeing in this Maryland colony is such a contrast from what truly resides in the Roman Catholic Church is just unbelievable. But we'll read this book and try to glean from it what we can to help try to understand what's happening in the world today. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur and Cross the Board. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, 
when the third temple is built answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.